Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Alex Pollock of the R Street Institute, and it's a pleasure for Desmond Lockman and me to welcome you to our conference on the new Italian government's challenge to Europe, a very timely discussion indeed. Uh, Italy's Deputy Prime Minister has responded to the European Union's objections to Italy's proposed budget by vowing that the interest of the Italian people comes ahead of the bureaucrats. The bureaucrats, of course, being the European Union. Uh, it's its position that there are rules and the rules are the same for everybody. So we'll see how that uh, discussion of those two different points of view comes about. How should we think about the challenges posed by the new and aggressive domestic politics of Italy? Uh, combined with its very large government debt, weak banks, and strained public finances. Or in Desmond's more forthright description, the country has a massive public debt mountain and the shakiest of banking systems. Uh, we all know Greek government debt put Europe and the euro into a financial crisis. Could Italy? Will it? Italy is, of course, a lot bigger than Greece and its challenges correspondingly greater. Its population is five times that, is Gre uh, that of Greece, and its government debt nearly seven times as big. Should the European Central Bank's support of Italian government bonds and banks be seen, as has been suggested, mere subterfuges for financing Italian government deficits, just a way to make German savers subsidize Italians' early retirement? Along with that, can Italy escape the so-called doom loop of mutual dependence between weak banks and financially weak governments as they both drag each other down? Uh, says one expert, as of today, the doom loop is very big and very much alive in Italy. And we'll see if our panel agrees with that. Uh, if the Italian government persists in a budget not in conformity with the EU rules, Will it lead to a confrontation of political wills, a showdown? Could that lead to Ital exit from the euro, perhaps with debt restructuring along the way? Or is the exit simply not on the agenda, as some have suggested? If there is a confrontation, which side will blink first? Uh, if instead there's a dialogue, how will the dialogue proceed? Uh, we're lucky to have an excellent and expert panel to address these complex, challenging, and interacting forces and problems. Let me introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Uh, first will be Luigi Zingales, the Robert C. McCormick Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He's also a faculty research fellow for the, Interna for the National Bureau of Economic Research a fellow of the European Governance Institute and a director of the Stigler Center at the University of Chicago, a student of political economy and the economic effects of culture. His many publications include Saving Capitalism from Capitalists and Capitalism for the People. Uh, next will be Ashok Modi, the Charles and Marie Robertson Visiting Professor in International Economic Policy at the Woodrow Wilson School of Princeton University and a fellow of the Center of Financial Studies in Frankfurt. Previously, he was deputy director in the International Monetary Fund, where he was responsible for the design of Ireland's successful financial rescue program. And at the World Bank, he advised governments worldwide on projects and policies. And he is the author of Euro Tragedy, a Drama in Nine Acts. Uh, then Sylvia Merlor. Sylvia is an affiliate fellow at Bruegel, a Brussels-based think tank. Before Bruegel, she was an economic analyst and the Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs of the European Commission. Her main research interests are international macro and financial economics, central banking, and European institutions and policy making. She's recently published Italy's Capital Flight 2011, 2016, and early 2018 in late 2018, Sylvia. <laughs> um, 
Next, uh, Carlo Bastazin, who is an editorialist at the Italian newspaper, Il Sole 24 Ore, The Sun 24 Hours, and a non-resident fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. Carlo's work focuses on European political and economic analysis. A winner of several prizes in journalism, he's the author of Saving Europe, Anatomy of a Dream, and recent articles on the people versus finance. Europe needs a new strategy to counter Italian populists and Italy's hazardous new experiment, genetically modified populism. Uh, our last speaker, my good friend and colleague Desmond, colleague, uh, Desmond Lachman, is a resident fellow at AEI where he focuses on the global macro economy. Desmond is fondly known by all for seeing the bright side of things as once again on the issues of Italy and its massive debt amidst our global financial market bubble. Desmond writes extensively on international economics, financial crises, strains in the euro area, and daunting financial problems like Italy, Greece, and Puerto Rico, and he is the organizer of this conference. Thank you, Desmond, on behalf of us all for getting us together for this most timely discussion. Uh, each panelist will speak from 12 to 15 minutes, after which we'll give them a chance to react to each other or to clarify points. Uh, after that, we'll open the floor to your questions, and we will adjourn promptly at noon. Uh, Luigi, many thanks for being with us, and you have the floor. Thank you very much. I generally am always the last one with the name Z, so I don't know what uh, I owe this privilege <laughs> of starting this panel. Um, so I will start by describing, there was a, a famous Italian uh, writer that used to say that the, in Italy the situations are critical but not serious. And I think that that represents very well what is the Italian situation today. It's very critical, and it's very critical because Italy is a country that has not been growing for 20, 25 years, it's not been growing in GDP, in GDP per capita, in productivity. It's a country where the level of uh, youth unemployment at some point reached 43%, now is only 31%, in which only 17% of people between 15 and 25 actually have a job. And every year, 250,000 people leave. We talk about the immigration crisis. We have an immigration crisis. We have the best and the brightest, financed, by the way, by the, the state, that leave the country and go to make uh, Germany, the United States, rich. And uh, it's a country where criminality is pervasive. And I'm not talking about the mafia, which of course is very important. I'm talking about business. So the biggest project to save Venice, the Moses, cost the Italian taxpayers more than three billion, of which one went in bribes. And nothing will ever be done. And Venice is still sink sinking. You look at the top level of the administration, you go to a bank, and what you are afraid is not to be robbed by the bankers, you're robbed by the, bank, by the people in the banks, by the bankers themselves. Uh, you know, I, I did a study on NPLs, and 6% uh, of the CEOs of banks have been indicted, not investigated, everybody's investigated in Italy, indicted for crimes, excluding usury, because as I said, usury is the business model, it's not uh, uh, a, a deviation. And, and then you go to the top of uh, uh, the establishment, and the top of the establishment, you see people that corrupt all the place. So uh, the guy who was in charge of uh, any and Enel for many, many years had been admitted of having paid the bribes 20 years ago, and now is investigated to have paid other bribes. Uh, the former president of Confindustria, now chairman of uh, uh, ENI, uh, her brother pay a bribe to ENI, admitted, okay? Uh, and the former vice chairman of Confindustria, uh, Montante, is now in, indicted for bribes, and you keep going. Uh, Confindustria, which is the Association of Industrialists, won a newspaper that Carlo writes in, and I used to write it, and uh, the uh, newspaper is, in that, is investigated for f financial fraud and uh, misappropriation. So the industrialists, when they run a newspaper, they can't even run it in a way that is transparent and decent. And uh, so all this, I did not even mention the South. You take the problem, you multiply by a factor of three or four, and you have the South. So everything is worse in the South, and that's the reason why people are, are, are desperate. And then, of course, you add the public debt. 
uh, which is very large, and in a country that doesn't grow in productivity and thing, is is pretty uh, dramatic situation. So why do I say it's not serious? Because look at the debate today. It says all the debate. You look at the newspaper. All the debate is about uh, the budget and the spread. Now, if there is one thing that doesn't kill us immediately, it will kill us eventually, and then there is a very serious banking loop. Uh, is the spread why? Because we have a seven years maturity, so the impact of this increase in cost is not immediate, number one. Number two, uh, we are seven years away from the previous crisis, so the debt maturing today is a debt with much higher interest rates. So if we just re renew the debt uh, at the current rate, we're not making the, temporarily the deficit worse. Now, eventually, of course, we'll get, but it's not like a, a, an immediate crisis. The second, because there seems to be this big tension. Everybody's about this new government, new policy. I'm asking, wait a second, what is new in the government? What is new in the policy? <laughs> so the government has announced, that's the only thing we know, that we'll have a 2.4 uh, budget deficit for the next three years. Now they're saying only for the next year. Now, what was the budget deficit in 2017? It was 2.3. What is the electoral plan of Renzi? 2.9 for three years. So if anything, they seem to be more moderate than the previous government. And then I can go in uh, what is their strategy is fiscal transfer. Uh, what were, uh, fiscal transfer to do what? To buy electoral votes. What did Renzi when he got elected? Added fiscal transfer of 80 euros to everybody just to win the European election in 2014. And, uh, and I can keep going with so many similarities that are actually pretty scary because uh, the uh, universal basic income, uh, it was invented by the Democratic Party. It was called uh, Reddito di Inclusione. And the only thing that the Five Star Movement is trying to do is trying to increase the number of people that qualify. Um, what about the immigration policy? It seems that there is a big change. Forgot that the Gentiloni government at Miniti that was basically paying the Libyan to keep the immigrants in concentration camp in Libya. Is that a big difference with Salvini? Salvini is more vocal, but uh, not, not is, is changing. Uh, what about incompetence? Uh, this government shows a lot of incompetence, absolutely. What about the previous one? All the major reforms in Italy have been struck down by the Supreme Court because unconstitutional. The electoral reform, the labor market reform, uh, the Madia reform of the public administration, <laughs> the reform on the uh, Populari, all the reforms did not pass uh, that. Uh, now, there are a lot of people without a uh, university degree in this government. So was the previous government. Uh, the, the Ministry of Education in Italy not, not only did not have a college degree, did not even have a high school degree. Okay? So uh, I don't see the big change uh, except maybe for two things. Number one, uh, the, P the previous government was much more in bed with the financial establishment than this one. Uh, why? Uh, the latter government did a uh, reform in which the seniorage was transferred to banks to prop up the banks. If there is one thing, I am a guy that wants to minimize the government, but there is one thing that belongs to the government. It's called seniorage. The fact that the seniorage was actually transferred to the banks to prop them up uh, it really irritates me. Uh, second, uh, we just discovered that uh, they were very friendly with, uh, in making concession. So uh, Autostrada got a renewal for many, many years uh, at an outrageous rate. They guaranteed 11% uh, of return. And that is really a, a scream. They wanted to have the Olympics in Rome. Now, what brought really the, the, the straw that broke the camel in Greece was the Olympics in Greece. And in Rome, they still have to pay the debt of the 1960 Olympics. Okay? And they want to do the Olympics. Why? Because all the builders wanted to build the Olympics. Uh, they did a bank rescue that was indecent, in my view. And the kick was a Cristiano Ronaldo law. You know why Cristiano Ronaldo uh, ca came to play in Italy? It's not because Juventus is a good team. It's because the Renzi government did a special law in which if you are from uh, abroad and you come to Italy, you have a cap. You don't pay more than $100,000 in taxes. So Cristiano Ronaldo is receiving 
25 million, he pays $100,000 in taxes. And of course, who also moved with Cristiano Ronaldo? Davide Serra, a friend of Renzi, who, by the way, now is employing Matteo Renzi as he is in, as he is in parliament. So I think that uh, that seems to me one big difference. The previous government was completely captured. This one is likely to be captured, but remain to be seen. The second is the attitude vis-a-vis -vis Europe. And this is uh, in, uh, in uh, the previous government was taking everything that Europe was doing. So there was a BRRD that was clearly not appropriate given the Italian situation. And uh, we had a government where the finance minister, the economic minister, was the number two, the previous number two of the Bank of Italy. Shouldn't he know the fragility of the Italian banking sector? Shouldn't he know that under his supervision, banks had crammed the portfolio of depositors with risky debt? He should have known and he accepted that that debt could be converted into equity overnight. Without anything. Why? For the good of Europe. And what about the budget confrontation? If you look, read the newspapers of two or three years ago, the Renzi government was always fighting for more flexibility vis-a-vis -vis Europe. The only difference is they were more polite in this. Why? Because they actually wanted to portray as, as pro-European, without admitting that uh, uh, Europe has some fundamental flaws. Has some fundamental flaws that are primarily responsibility of us economists, because we designed a system, of course the politician in those, but we designed a system that was not adapt to the situation and very much backward looking than forward looking. We designed a system to fight only one enemy, inflation, and forgetting the number one issue of a bank, of a central bank, is financial stability. The reason why in the United States we have a Federal Reserve Bank was not to fight inflation, was to prevent instability in the financial system. And the European Central Bank does not have any mandate on financial stability. The only thing is uh, keep the price level uh, below uh, an inflation of 2%. And uh, in fact, there's not even have a mandate against deflation, because if this deflation is still below 2%, then they are fine. And uh, so I think that th that's a problem number one. Problem number two is we know that a a euro area, a common currency area, does not work without some fiscal transfer. And uh, those fiscal transfer, or at least some risk sharing, they were not designed to begin with. They were not designed knowingly. There is a very famous interview that uh, Prodi gave to the Financial Times in 2000. And he said, uh, we knew when we, Prodi was the prime minister who brought Italy to the, into the euro, said so we knew that the system uh, was not designed with a proper mechanism, but he said there will be a crisis, and when the crisis will hit, those mechanisms will be made in place. And he was right that there would be a crisis, and that was very prescient. Unfortunately, during the crisis, very little has been done. So after 10 years of the crisis, we have two or three of the legs of the banking union, but the third one is completely missing, and we are doomed to have a, uh, a, a bank sovereign group. In fact, I said that the, the spread does not kill us immediately, but it does kill us through the banking sector. The Italian banking sector is still weak, is recovering, is doing better, has made a lot of progress, has recapitalized a lot, uh, but it's still weak, and is full of Italian government bond. Like uh, the, the US banking sector is full of US bond. But imagine if Illinois was full of Illinois uh, state bond. All the, the Illinois banks would be in trouble because the Illinois budget is a disaster, actually. The only f thing that makes me feel home in Chicago is Chicago politics and Chicago public finance. Uh, they are exactly like the Italian ones, OK? And so, but the difference is that uh, the, the, the banks in Chicago can still land because they are not full of government bonds, they're not full of uh, Illinois bonds, and because there is a federal deposit insurance that uh, will pay, not a Illinois deposit insurance that will not be worth the paper is written on, and because we have a system of transfer so that if there is a moment of unemployment, actually 
in uh, uh, the, the part of the unemployment insurance is paid by federal funds and not by Illinois funds. So I think that, uh, in my view, this government takes the wrong approach to fight uh, against Europe. Uh, but I think as a correct vision that Europe needs to be reformed, and there is no willingness to reform. Uh, one, one thing I would like to ask the panelists when I answer is, what is, in their view, the chance that within the next five years, we have some form of unemployment insurance, some form of uh, 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 protection for banks and deposit insurance? Uh, I don't think that uh, any of this is, is likely to come anytime soon, uh, certainly not with, with the current environment. So I think that uh, uh, is a very, very difficult situation. And uh, I uh, don't think that the government is acting particularly well. In fact, uh, I think that uh, I can go for all the list of the things they've done wrong. Uh, it's much easier to say what you have done wrong. It's much more difficult to say what you should do. And I would like to leave the panel with a question. Uh, Mario Monti wrote a very sharp editorial last Sunday saying that uh, the responsibility or the fault of these politicians is that they want to be reelected. And in a democracy, that's not a bug, it's a feature. We have a democratic system because we want people to be accountable, <coughs> we want elected to be accountable to people. And so the question is, if in Italy, and maybe we can change, but if in Italy that's what people want, how are you gonna do it uh, otherwise? Thank you, Luigi, for those very interesting and colorful comments. I will mention that in the 19th century, in this country, uh, when all banks were chartered by states, many states required their banks, as a condition of getting their charter, to invest heavily in the state bonds. And they created a doom loop between the state bonds and the state banks, just uh, as you Absolutely. were suggesting. You had a bank every t a bank <laughs> crashed every 10 or 15 years. So it was <laughs> Absolutely a right. Okay, thank you. Ashok. So, um, uh, my theme is slightly different from Luigi's. I'm going to give you a lot of data and pictures to show you that Italy, quite irrespective of the government it has, is in an extraordinarily adverse macroeconomic and macrofinancial condition. And the next several months could easily precipitate a, uh, a financial crisis of a huge magnitude. Uh, the, my fans at the American Enterprise Institute have blown up the cover of my book. Uh, that was not my intention. But what I am doing is not talking about my book, but I'm drawing on the framework of my book. But all the data that I'm going to present is updated till about yesterday or a few days ago. So this, this is sort of the original sin of, of, the, of the euro. So uh, one of my left-hand side pictures has disappeared. But if, if, it, if, it was, if it was going to be there, it would have shown you that the lira went from 200 mark, marks, uh, sorry, uh, one mark bought 200 liras in 1970 and about 1,200 marks in 1998. So the, the lira depreciated continuously and by a huge, um, huge magnitude uh, over the course uh, of the previous 30 years. This was a period in which Italy had positive productivity growth, although declining. So even in a period when Italy had positive productivity growth, Italy needed the crutch of a depreciating uh, lira. Italy is essentially was becoming uncompetitive by, by the early 80s. Uh, the northern parts of Italy uh, were the white goods, uh, the, the refrigerators, the washing machines, all that was becoming uh, a, a thing of the past, Olivetti. So it, the Italian industry was essentially disappearing and Italy needed the desperate crutch of a depreciating lira. You come to the post-Euro period, that is 1999 to 2018. The lira now is embedded in the euro, so by definition, the lira does not depreciate against the Deutsche Mark. Uh, 
But the lira also, the euro, because of the European Central Bank's tendency for a tight monetary policy, bias towards a tight monetary policy, the euro today at 1.16 is almost exactly where it was on January 4th, 1999, when it was first uh, introduced. So in effect, the euro has remained stable through these fluctuations uh, against, the, uh, against the dollar. Therefore, the lira has also not depreciated against the dollar. So the lira has not depreciated against the Deutsche Mark or the dollar. And during these 20 years, Italy has had negative productivity growth. So you see those green bars? They say that they are, they, it's not just that it has low productivity growth, it has negative productivity. This is the sort of fundamental reason why Italian per capita income has fallen. So Italy essentially in a broad macro condition is in a very tight situation. The, the thesis was uh, of, of uh, Italian leaders, and I've got many Italians here on the panel and in the, in the audience, so if I don't say this right, uh, they had this thesis of vincolo esterno. The vincolo esterno idea was you put Italy into the Eurozone, it will create a discipline, and Italians uh, will get their act together politically and, and economically. Well, they didn't. And so the Italians now are living under the double disadvantage of a dysfunctional government, series of governments at home, and a euro that constrains them from a lack of depreciation. And so as Luigi said, what you see is high youth unemployment, young college-educated Italians leaving in growing numbers. I draw sort of the further inference from this that therefore Italy is now in a permanent growth trap. Because Italy grows slowly, unemployment is high. Because unemployment is high, the educated leave. Because the educated leave, Italy, Italian growth remains low because investment in R&D and innovation remains low. And this is a sort of a self-perpetuating low growth trap which continues and there's no clear way of breaking this. This is, the, this is the overall macro background. In the short run, then what are the, what, what is the prospect of growth in the short run? So the first thing you want to notice is that over the last 150 years, Italian growth is highly tied to world trade growth. This is true for all Euro area countries. The Euro, European countries are trading nations. Therefore, when world trade moves, it, their domestic growth rate moves almost in tandem. Indeed, I say often that if you want one variable to predict Eurozone growth, you just need world trade. So by these numbers, which I have the blue line, when world trade growth is about 4%, Italian growth should go to about zero. So notice over here, these are now recent numbers from uh, August 95 to May of, uh, to, to the very latest numbers, whatever July or August numbers. So take the first part from August 2015 to late, 19, uh, late 2016. This is a period in which ECB bond purchases ha had, had begun to flow in, in huge numbers, but basically did not move the growth rate. World trade growth was low, and so was Eurozone growth. Sometime in the early uh, 2017, China began to pump a huge amount of stimulus into its domestic economy. China is extraordinarily influential in determining the pace of world trade. World trade picked up. Your Eurozone growth picked up. You see all the three major countries, uh, Greece, uh, sorry, uh, Italy, uh, France, and Germany growth picked up. Sometime in early 2018, the Chinese said, oops, and they began to scale back their stimulus. World trade growth has been slowing down. With world trade growth slowing down, Eurozone growth is slowing down. There's no mystery about it. This is, this is a pattern that's, that's existed for 150 years. It's a pattern that remains today. World trade growth now is very close to 4%. In fact, if you just take the last three months, it's slightly under 4%. By my reckoning, uh, China will continue to slow because China cannot afford to keep pumping up its economy. We don't know if China will have a crisis. People have been predicting a Chinese crisis for a long time, and they have uh, proven to be wrong. But at the very least, the China is likely to decelerate. 
China diesel rates, world trade growth grows to 3.5%. Italy, in my view, at that point, even as early as the second half of this year, goes into a recessionary conditions. It's very important for a number of reasons that you will see in a minute. Italy also has an ECB problem. And in a, in a way, Luigi ref referred to this, the ECB has this asymmetric bias. It fights inflation, but does not fight deflation. It introduced the uh, bond purchases of what are called the quantitative easing too late. By then, the deflationary forces had begun to set in. Every year since it's introduced its uh, quantitative easing, the ECB says inflation will rise. You see those da dotted lines? Those are the predictions of what inflation is likely to be. Every year it says, oops, it did not happen. But guess what? Next year it is going to happen. And 2018, you see, you see the, the dark line is the actual, and the forecast is still uh, that inflation will go up. Inflation will not go up because by now, over a long period of time, inflation has remained low, expectations have changed, therefore price setting behavior and consumer behavior has adapted to that. People don't expect prices to change. Therefore, monetary policy, just like in Japan, has become disengaged from the price setting behavior. The, the model that the ECB uses for its forecasting is the wrong model, which is why it gets its predictions wrong again and again. Monetary union creates divergence, so already a low inflation rate. Italian inflation is significantly lower than the German inflation rate, which is, uh, which is to be expected. Italian inflation has hovered between half and three quarters of a percent. Italian interest rates now rising to two and a half to three and a half percent. Italian real interest rates, the inf interest rate discounted for inflation, now is well over two percent. Depending on what the day is, it's, it's sometimes approaching two and a half percent. For a country that has a potential growth of three quarters of a percent, which is likely to go into recessionary conditions uh, in, in the coming uh, months, the real interest rate is extraordinarily high, which means that the real interest rate is going to push growth down further, push inflation down further, which means the real interest rate will continue to rise. I'm going to give a, this is, this is my only somewhat complicated chart, but I, I do want to walk you through this because this is a very important chart. I am making the claim that the European Central Bank's credibility is even weaker than that of the Bank of Japan. So what, I, what, I'm, what I've done here is I've, I've aligned the bond purchases to the same date, which is called zero. And once the bond purchases start, you see that the currency depreciates because the, the bond purchases reduce the interest rate, which, which brings the value of the currency down. But notice that while the Japanese, through their Abenomics initiative, did manage to get a somewhat depreciated exchange rate, the European Central Bank did not even manage to do that because the European Central Bank never had a commitment to the bond purchases. Within, within two years, began to say, we are going to taper in January of 2017. And indeed, they have delivered the taper which means that the, uh, the euro exchange rate has remained ex sort of exactly where it was when the bond purchases started. For Italy, this is a special problem because Italy desperately needs uh, a depreciated exchange rate, be, uh, both to boost growth and to boost inflation. So Italy is, uh, is suffering from a triple disadvantage, in inherent, uh, inherent growth weakness, a slowdown in world trade, an ECB policy that, that tends, creates ten, a tendency towards deflation and, a, and an exchange rate that is too strong for Italy. And so you have this so-called uh, uh, bank uh, government uh, doom, doom loop. You see the reemergence of this. You see uh, this, is, this is now, this reemergence is tied to the new government. It's tied to the new government in the following sense, that the spike you see in the, in the government bond yield and the, the, the latest decline you see in the uh, prices of bank stocks is timed to the original uh, 
uh, memo that the government uh, had offered, which causes, caused a huge consternation uh, in the days after they, they, were, uh, they were beginning to form the government. But the point is that if, if such a small tremor can, can cause it to reemerge, it means that it was lying latent. Again, as Luigi said, the banks, despite their progress, are very weak, and the uh, government's finances are very, very delicate. So the, 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 the loop was always there, and the, the smallest sort of, uh, you know, uh, Per Bach, a physicist, had this, has this, had this analogy that if you have a sand pile, uh, and you keep adding grains of sand on that sand pile, the sand pile continues to grow, but there's a moment at which you put a, another grain on the sand pile and the sand pile begins to disintegrate. You're beginning to see that process evolving uh, over here. So I conclude, uh, this is a Yogi Berra quote, the future ain't what it used to be. With world trade growth slowing down, there's, there's a sharp slowdown occurring uh, in, in the uh, Eurozone economy. I don't think people have sort of uh, realized how rapid that pace is. I mean, the the, the, the uh, Italian government's projections of one and a half to 2% growth are completely unrealistic. But even, uh, even, even other agencies are still continuing to think that they are going to have somewhat growth a, a above 1%. I would be stunned if in the next year Italian growth is uh, over 1%. I would not be stunned if the Q on Q, or what we in, a, in sort of forecasting terminology call quarter on quarter growth rates actually become zero in the coming, in the coming weeks, uh, coming sort of months. So you have high real interest rates, you have strong euro, low growth, and I sort of end more for discussion than to sort of elaborate on that if Italy has a crisis, the financial safety nets, including what are called the uh, outright monetary transactions, while technically available, will face very severe political limits. And indeed, under those political limits, could well crack. Thank you, Ashok. We'll, we'll see if Desmond can surpass your pessimism. Here. <laughs> right, so, Sylvia. Thank you. <laughs> Sylvia. Uh, so, I am by far the least distinguished member of this very distinguished Oh, no, 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 don't say that. Um, and I also happen to be one of those young Italians, college educated, who emigrated, so a lot of pressure here um, <laughs> on a lot of uh, uh, dimensions. I'm going to talk about something that economists don't really like that much, which is to say politics. Um, but it's becoming really important, and uh, it's going to be very important in the next few months. So um, political instability is definitely not something new in the Italian context. We had 65 governments in 72 years after the Second World War. So if you do the math, the average shelf life of an Italian government is below two years, which is um, rather unusual. Uh, but I do believe that the situation now is very special and it will be especially challenging for Europe and for Italy itself. And a lot of uh, the reason why I do think so has to do with this picture. Uh, those of you who have been following the Italian elections. We need this, hang on, hang on just a minute. Do we need, need better microphone here? Okay. Oh, okay. You, maybe, you, maybe you could just uh, hold this, Sylvia. Thank you. Okay. Thank do you. you hear me well? <laughs> <laughs> So those of you who have been following the Italian elections probably have seen this picture before. This is a map of the electoral results in the single member district component of the seats allocation for the Italian parliament. And what is really striking about this picture is how geographically uh, deeply segmented the vote has been on a north-south axis with the um, center right, mostly the league in this picture, capturing the entire north and part of the center, which used to be a stronghold of the center left. Uh, which is the red uh, parts left you see there. And uh, the South going really en masse for a uh, five-star movement. Um, and I think this is really important right now because of how this geographical segmentation of the votes constrains the policy options that are available to the political parties in the coalition. And also because we haven't really seen this geographical political polarization in Italian societies for, uh, society for a long time, I would say, um, certainly not after the, the early 90s. So how did we get here? 
is the first question. A lot of this has to do with the economy, which Ashoka uh, did a great job in uh, explaining. Italy has been getting poorer. This is real per capita GDP in the three parts of the countries, of which three, I don't think, oh, oh yeah, you do see the, uh, the labels there. Um, ever since 2007, after real GDP had been growing for constantly for uh, many years, it's been decreasing during the global financial crisis and the euro crisis afterwards. To the point that in 2014, real per capita GDP was at the level as it was in 1995. It's now rebounded a bit, but we're still back to 1999. Uh, and if you read the Shoka's book, is, uh, he has uh, very compelling arguments about uh, uh, what the Italy membership in the single country has to do with this as well. So um, this is clearly one important factor. But on top of becoming poorer, not everyone has, be, has become poor in the same way. So uh, the incidence of individual relative poverty has increased pretty much everywhere during the crisis, uh, but only marginally in the north and center, and much more so in the south, which is the red bar that you see there. Together with economic slowdown, of course, unemployment has been going up. Uh, you have a total unemployment on your left. Uh, total unemployment had been declining uh, since 1995 till 2007, and it's been increasing significantly afterwards. Again, unemployment is now at the level where it was in 1995. So effectively, 20 years of unemployment decline have been lost during the crisis for Italy. But what is perhaps more important for, um, in relation to the demographics of the vote is the figure on your right, which is youth unemployment. Ishaka talked about this. This is... Um, picture that shows you how it's uh, very different across regions. So uh, youth unemployment in the south is significantly higher than uh, youth unemployment in the north, which you can also see here. This is the, date for, the data for 2017. So total unemployment in the south is 20% still. Uh, youth unemployment is 50%, one in every two people uh, below 25 years is without a job. And those uh, numbers are significantly higher than the country average. So. This being the um, underlying economic and social backgrounds, then politics come in, comes in in the early 2018. Uh, both Lega and Five Star had fiscally expansionary promises in their electoral campaigns. But what is remarkable, and I think it's different from previous um, electoral campaigns, is that those promises were very specifically tailored to the two different parts of the country. The league's fiscal, core fiscal program was about um, flat tax on personal income, so it's uh, essentially redistribution towards the top of the income distribution, and it's inherently revenue reducing. Uh, Five-star core fiscal program was the citizenship income, so obviously appealing to the youth um, unemployed in the south and uh, targeting the bottom of the income distribution. So the question that has been in the back of everyone's mind ever since these two parties decided to form a coalition is how do you square the circle? How do you, um, how do you combine a fiscal policy which is inherently revenue reducing, like the leagues with a fiscal policy that is inherently expenditure increasing and expanding the welfare state as five stars? Uh, and we had the answer uh, last week which is you, you do uh, recourse to budget deficit, which is now expected to be at 2.4 for 2019 and the next two years. So it looks very much like an instance of what has become famous in the Brexit negotiations and as the doctrine of having your own cake and eat it. But the question that uh, uh, we're going to face in the next two months is whether it is really that simple. So can you really have your cake and eat it too? Uh, there's a lot of doubt about it. Part of that has to do with the economy itself. Um, clearly, politics prevailed in the budget negotiations. The finance minister wanted a much conservative budget of, um, with a deficit of maximum 1.8%. Uh, but the question is whether politicians realize that economic conditions are such that the actual fiscal space they have available for uh, keeping their promises may be narrower than they actually think the 2.4% uh, uh, percent of uh, deficit implies. Um, the finance minister has given, we still don't have the numbers, so this is a, a bit of a speculation on our hand, but the finance minister gave an interview a few days ago uh, with a prominent newspaper 
where he said that in light of the growth deterioration, which is now expected, the 2019 budget deficit was going anyway to be at unchanged policies, close to 2%, 2.2%. So the aim of this comment on the finance minister's side was to basically say, look, 2.4% is not going to be a huge dramatic change. But what this implies for politics is that if you really want to keep 2.4%, then the fiscal space that you actually have is much narrower than politicians might be realizing. So the question is, will they keep the 2.4% or will they prioritize keeping their promises, which would mean the budget deficit eventually may be even bigger than we're seeing now. The second, the second um, assumption on which there's really a lot of uncertainty is growth, which for a country uh, with a sizable public debt like Italy is the key variable that we should be looking at. The finance minister said they expected growth at 1.6, 1.7 in the next two years, uh, respectively. The Minister for European Affairs went as far as saying 2 and 3 percent. Both the conservative and the extreme version of these estimates are way above consensus, which is now around 1 percent really uh, maximum. So the question is where does the growth miracle come from? Um, and again, based on the comments in the interview by the finance minister, it looks like it's going to come from public investment. But public investment is only 0.2% of GDP uh, in, uh, in the planned budget deficit, so uh, this would imply a very large fiscal multiplier, which is kind of implausible. Then, of course, there are, on top of economic, there are political and institutional constraints. The Italian constitution includes some provisions that are aimed at ensuring budget uh, stability and debt sustainability, particularly Article 81 of the Constitution, which says um, a recourse to borrowing is feasible only for countercyclical purposes or in ex exceptional circumstances. So this opens the door for the President of the Republic in his capacity as guarantor of the Constitution to object to the constitutionality of the budget that has been presented. He has actually hinted in this direction recently a few times, um, and Salvini's response has been very clearly showing that he's willing to take on the confrontation. The problem is that going down this road would be probably without precedence, and it would be bound to open a very serious institutional struggle uh, with uh, quite an unclear outcome for, um, for, the Italian, for the Italian Republic. And on top of the domestic constraints, of course, there are the European constraints. Italy is a member of the European Union. Uh, under EU rules, the European Commission will examine the budget and give an opinion by the end of November. Clearly, Brussels is not going to like this budget very much. Uh, 2.4 does not breach the limit in the Stability and Growth Pact, which is 3%, but it's unchanged for three years in the current, uh, at least as far as we know now. So it would be moving away from the medium-term objective um, in, the, in the Italian uh, public finance documents. At the same time, Italy does not comply with the debt reduction rule uh, of the SGP. And considering what we said about the growth assumptions, it's unlikely that it will comply anytime soon in the next two years. So of course, uh, on the commission sides, there will be the uh, the basis on which to object to this budget and perhaps open an infringement procedure. The problem is that for the Commission, there is really no good option right now. Because on one hand, they could open an infringement procedure, uh, go into a full confrontation with the Italian government, fuel at Italian Euroscepticism right ahead of the European Parliament election in 2019. The European Parliament election are already expected to deliver a much more Eurosceptic Parliament than we have ever seen before. So, of course, uh, this is going to be uh, a very tricky choice to make. Or the alternative is cave in, lose any credibility both for the institution and for the rules and then allow the Liga and Five Star government to anyway bank on the fact that they can say they've been the first government to successfully confront it and, um, and reported a victory over European institutions. So on Brussels' side, the uh, Commission would probably prefer for the markets to do the dirty job, meaning to exert a, suffic a sufficiently high uh, pressure that the Italian government may change their mind. But of course, uh, as we have seen in 2015, 2015 uh, 2011, and 20 in 2015, sorry, uh, whenever you, uh, you resort to market pressure, you have to be very careful for what you wish for. Uh, particularly, we have already started seeing pressure from the markets on Italy. 
the budget has not been well received, but we have seen uh, worrying signs during the summer uh, in terms of uh, capital outflows from portfolio liabilities, mostly concentrated on Italian government debt, but the banking sector has been affected too, and also the corporate sector. There's been a bit of a rebound in June, which is not shown in this chart, but we're still lacking the um, uh, August and September data that will be uh, probably key to understand what is the uh, longer term uh, trend there. So markets are, are already quite uh, shaky uh, based on the numbers that they have seen. And this is really worrying because we're walking into uh, rating decisions in October and November. And Italy is currently two notches above junk stages, uh, as you see, in terms of, um, of rating. So um, it, this could really accelerate a financial crisis and potentially uh, with the worst outcome of Euro exit as well. So concluding, um, the, fiscal prog the fiscal path on which the Italian government is currently on uh, seems, to be, um, seems to be taking them in full confrontation, both with Brussels, but also with potentially uh, institutional constraints that exist at the domestic level. Uh, testing both the strength of uh, the European and the, and the Italian institutional constraints at, the per at this particular point in time may, may, be very, uh, may be very worrying and potentially very uh, dangerous, both for, both for the cohesion of the Italian society that we have seen as, as really um, polarized right now, and also for the implication that this might have for Italian membership in the Eurozone and, and in the European Union. So we're working on knife hedge once again, um, and the, the next two months, October and November, will definitely be the key time to watch to understand what will happen next. Thank you. Thank you. Carlo? Thank you. I don't think, uh, does, does Carlo need the microphone, or is he? Yeah, you can, let's try. Let's, let's try. try. If you it like that to, better, that's fine. Seems to work, even without. Yeah. Uh, thanks to AEI for it. Having me here, I guess we have some slide too. Yeah, okay. if you just press the green button. Yeah. yeah. So thanks for having me. Uh, I sometimes think that the self-deprecating attitude that Italians have so uh, prominently is a uh, psychological defense mechanism which is necessary to live in a country which looks very much like the Tower of Pisa, always inclined but never falls. Uh, my question is uh, to uh, today is Italy's living a Varoufakis moment. Uh, let me say first, uh, um, Silvia explained very uh, clearly how important this figure in the budget uh, is, this 2.4 deficit is. Well, let me say how it came uh, to life. Um, Italy has not a populist government. It has two populist governments stitched together, rather badly, competing for who has the most resounding populist voice. So, Finance Minister Tria uh, entered the negotiations with the European Commission and uh, for one month they agreed that the deficit would have been 1.6. Then the Lega stepped in and said, no, I want 2%. And then finally, at the, really, at the very last moment, the M5 star movement asked 2.4 and the Lega aligned to the highest request. Why? Because you're competing. There are two competing forces. What happens in this case is uh, we, we might see it happen again uh, when the European Commission will probably demand for a modified version of the draft budget plan mid this year, October 15. And uh, obviously what everybody wants to know is how they will react. How will the Lega and the M5 star movement react? Whether this competitive radicalism will again, as in this case, uh, bring to the most uh, uh, awkward and difficult confrontation with the European Commission? Well, essentially, 
my sense is that what we are experiencing in these hours is showing one of the fastest retrenchments of the Italian army since one century, since the uh, Caporetto case. And they are already changing the deficit uh, bottom figures, changing from 2.4 to 2.1 next year and 2.0 the year after. And this is probably what will happen. Uh, the context that we are observing is completely different from the Varoufakis context. The EU Commission is uh, running out of time, is living on borrowed time, and uh, Schäuble is not there. Merkel is probably giving up and candidating for the presidency of the, one of the two top jobs in Brussels. Juncker is leaving. The European uh, parliamentary elections are uh, next uh, May, so politics will be, in a way, less important than markets in exerting discipline on uh, Italy. And next December, in three months, we will have a contemporary negotiations on the budget, on the Italian budget, and on the reform of the euro area. On the table, there will be proposal for a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism and for an EDIS, a European a deposit insurance system, which will require some regular treatment of sovereign debt. So you will have two guns on the table pointed against the Italian government if it doesn't comply with fiscal discipline. And my answer is, looking at what happens today, they will comply. Let me skip some graphs, otherwise we don't get to the point. OK, I'll show you this. The thin line is a composite index of economic hardships uh, during the crisis, and the thicker line is a, a composite index of populist parties' consensus. There is a moment where the dynamic of populist parties gain a dynamic of its own and goes through the sky. So after you wait too much in facing the hardship, the economic hardships, they take a life of, them, of, of their own. What happens is that there is an abrupt rotation around the European axis in Italian consensus. So in 2013, pro-European majority was 80%. 80%. In 2018, pro-European minority, 35%. The consequence is that the government, sorry for the graph, I hope you can understand this graph. It took me eight hours to draw it. So <laughs> the uh, bars with the red caps are uh, Italy in 2012, I guess, and 2018, and the others are France and Germany. As you see, along three uh, criteria which I identify in terms of political economy, convergence toward the others, political integration and risk reduction, Italy is moving away, is shifting away from France and Germany. Now, uh, evidently responding to what we saw earlier as a change of mood among the uh, uh, Italian electorate, what does it, does it really mean that we had a brutal change in the fiscal strategy of the government? Well, this is a table published by the European Commission showing what, how Italy used to negotiate normally. And the strategy is very simple. Well, give me some break this year. I need to I, I need to have some fiscal space this year, but I will be so good in the coming years. So the first year's deficit is 3%. Let me go only to 2.9 next year. Unfortunately, as Silvia said, your Italian governments last one year. So I will be very good in the following years, and deficit will go to zero. Uh, what is happening now is exactly the same. It's 2.4%. Uh, this year, uh, sh uh, next year should have been the following year, 2.4. Now the strategy is changing. Let me have 2.4 this year as a deficit, and I will be a good boy in the coming year. So it doesn't change so dramatically from what we happened. Sorry for the complication of these graphs. This comes from a paper we were writing with uh, Messori Mischitelli for the uni Lewis University, uh, and this is uh, showing exactly these promises. Let me, those curves, 
are showing the deficit, the promises, the pledges that we'd, uh, we're making. Next year, let me go care carefully, and that'd be very good the following years. So you shift the adjustment to the following years every time, and the result is that the bars showing the level of public debt never go down. It's a different way of showing the same thing. This is slightly more complicated. Uh, below the axis is fiscal expansion. You give gas to the economy. Uh, above the axis is contraction, austerity. And uh, on the left side, the economy is not growing at the potential output level. And uh, on the right side, it's growing faster than the output, uh, potential output level. Uh, you want to be in the uh, lower and uh, left panel and the upper right panel to be anti-cyclical in your political, in your fiscal support. And you, it was hard to do this during the crisis because you had to react. You see that strange sl sloped curve in the upper left panel. It was when austerity came on top of contraction. And that was a moment when the populist movement gained a dynamic of its own. But in the most recent years, actually, it was a reasonable fiscal policy, slightly encouraging uh, while the economy was not at the potential uh, level. The point is that even that reasonable political economy doesn't bring down the debt. So there seems to be a kind of impossibility in bringing down a debt so high at that with a, with a, with a reasonable uh, fiscal policy. Why is Italy reacting uh, now so fast and changing by the hour the planned deficit for the next years? Essentially because it is touching a threshold, a pain threshold, which is the three hundred basis points between the BTP, the Italian Treasury, and the German Treasury. It is an incredibly important uh, threshold for some reason which I'm going to explain, and uh, which shows how the rhetoric of the politicians change immediately after you get close to the 300 basis points, they all say, oh no, we'll be good boys, we comply, we'll comply, and that's what I expect they will do in the next uh, weeks and months, and that's exactly what they were doing in the past. And so I, I, I don't see this, crit this juncture as a very critical moment from, uh, different from what happened in the past. So why is the 300 threshold so important? Well, basically because duration of Treasury bonds is seven years, so 300 basis points per year, roughly, respond to the planned devaluation that economists behind the government would have envisaged in the case of Italy exiting the euro. They said we need a 20% evaluation, which is exactly equivalent to 300 basis points per year. That means that when you get over that, the horizon becomes wobbly, uh, it, time becomes shorter, and you don't know how short it comes, particularly if you have some fixed date in your horizon, like October 15, for instance, when you have to present your draft budget plan, the commission will say, no, you don't comply. And you will say, I don't care if I don't comply. I'll go on with my uh, provocative, aggressive fiscal policy, which will not happen, I tell you. But this is something that the market reasonably can uh, Fear, at that point, you have a hyperbolic increase in risk coming close to the make it or break it date. Uh, the, one day before, you have the whole 20%, 2,000 basis points risk in one day. So it, if you break the 300% basis point threshold, you easily go to through the sky. And the third reason is obviously that banks portfolios are packed with Italian papers and they are losing uh, money because uh, government bonds uh, prices are going down 
and uh, these erode the capital base, and so you have uh, fewer chances to give credit to the economy if the economy grows less. The, GDP, the debt to GDP ratio uh, worsens. Uh, I'm not going to show you those uh, complicated graphs about how the public debt could, uh, could go uh, depending on the different choices of uh, the government. Let me just say that next December, you will have on the table of the ECOFIN, the finance ministers of the EU, two parallel negotiations. On one hand, what do we do with this Italian budget? And on the other, what do we do with the euro area reform? And basically, what we expect is that they agree on the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM, to provide a backstop for the single resolution fund, which is needed to break the doom loop, which people here envisage and so on. But unanimity is required for a revision of the ESM treaty, unanimity among the countries. And in some country, a qualified majority is required, which is obviously difficult in Germany. Within the Bundestag, the Alternative für Deutschland, this extreme right party, is having so much consensus that building numerically a, quant a, a, a qualified majority is not easy. So Berlin will have a hard stance at the negotiating table, even harder the Netherlands and Finland, who are very vocal in the pre-negotiation that I'm following. Same, they demand a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism to be uh, required before they approve the ESM treaty modification. Thank you. And uh, a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism is poison for Italy. So it will be an extremely weak position for the government at the negotiating table. And the same happens with the negotiate, negotiation about the European insurance system. So we might not have an agreement in December and uh, eventually no agreement in May after the European elections, uh, which will probably give us a worse uh, uh, pro-European, a less pro-European uh, uh, institutional setting in Europe. This means that the market will be uh, more, uh, will have a free hand to move. And I repeat, we are watching by the hour how their vincolo esterno, this effective discipline, is actually very effective. It's changing the mind of those populist parties uh, that have been so colorful and self-deprecatingly described earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Desmond. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, let me say that, uh, you know, just at the outset, that I don't buy the idea that we can muddle through indefinitely. I think that the situation in Italy <coughs> is both critical and very serious. And I'm more in utter <coughs> camp that we could see a full-blown crisis uh, the next year or so. Before I get into the reasons for my pessimism, I should just say that I think one really can't look at Italy in isolation. One really has to look at what's happening in the rest of the global economy. And this would add to the reason why I would be pessimistic in that we're now in a very different stage of the global liquidity cycle, largely because of what developments occurring in the United States. Federal Reserve raising interest rates, quantitative easing going into reverse in the United States, global liquidity being dried up, this makes for a very different level of tolerance amongst markets about wayward performers like Italy. Another reason, just from the global point of view, is what Ashok uh, indicated, you know, with China, with the trade war, trade looks like it could be very much different position before, which isn't too good for Italy. 
Uh, and the third thing I would say is there are developments in Germany that aren't at all encouraging the fact that Merkel's star is waning means that she might not have the clout to put together a rescue package for Italy uh, in the same way as she succeeded for doing for Germany. Uh, that was uh, a prologue. Uh, Very appropriate In terms in of my uh, uh, reasons for pessimism, I want to just touch on uh, four points, uh, four or five points. Uh, the first uh, I'm going to talk about is that Italy doesn't belong in the euro. Joining the euro was a huge mistake. I'd be echoing much of what Ashok indicated. Uh, the second point I'd make is that Italian growth prospects are rather poor. Uh, a third point is that <coughs> Italy's public debt is a lot worse than you think. Uh, and uh, the fourth major point I'd make is that Italy is, to use Wall Street's term, uh, too big to fail, but too big to bail. So let me uh, go through each of these points, and um, uh, that'll explain, you know, when I put them all together, why uh, I don't think this is going to have a happy ending. Uh, the key point is that Italy should not have joined the euro in the sense that it makes absolutely no sense to have a poor productivity performer with a strong productivity performer in a monetary union. So what occurs over time is that Italy loses huge amount of competitiveness to Germany. Uh, we see that since the euro uh, came into being, Italy's lost something like 20% percentage points of competitiveness to Germany, whether you measure a total factor productivity, labor productivity, it's the same story. They can't now do what they did prior to the euro, is restore the competitiveness through a devaluation. So what you get is incredibly poor performance of the Italian economy. It's really just remarkable that 20 years into the euro, the country's Per capita income is something like 6% below where it was in 1999. Uh, you know, talk about a lost decade. Here we're talking about two lost decades. Uh, and that, to me, does not look like a sustainable uh, position. So irrespective of what government is in place, if you don't get productivity going, uh, this gap is just going to widen. Tensions are just going to increase. Uh, not a good outcome. Uh, Second point uh, that we make is that Italy's growth prospects are poor. And I would just say that if Italy underperformed the rest of Europe and couldn't grow very well when global conditions were highly favorable to Italy in terms of very low interest rates, low oil prices, uh, a weak uh, euro, all of that didn't produce uh, growth in Italy. It also had a reform-minded government why do we think now that when the uh, global conditions aren't favorable and Italy's got a government that's going in reverse, wanting to unwind a bunch of reforms, wanting not having much of a commitment to budget discipline, why do we think that Italy is uh, going to grow very quickly? I'd also say that with Italy's... Uh, Interest rate spreads, you know, I'd agree that in terms of the maturity of the debt, it takes a while for that to feed through to mess up the public finances. But if you have interest rates rising through the economy, uh, going to the 2.5% positive in real terms that Oshok is pointing to, uh, that's a big drain on uh, the economy. If you've also got the banks stuffed with all of this uh, government bonds, their capital gets eroded. That means that you've really got conditions for a, a credit squeeze, uh, which means that the idea that Italy is going to grow by 1.5% uh, in 2019 uh, is really uh, incredibly dangerous, uh, wishful uh, thinking. Let me go to the third point, uh, just say that Italy's debt uh, is worse uh, than you think. Uh, you know, the chart that uh, I actually like that Carmen Reinhardt put together was taking Italy's public debt and adding into it Italy's 
obligations, the obligations of the Bank of Italy under the ECB's Target 2 program. You know, there's a mere 400 billion uh, data position that Italy has in the ECB that is basically public debt. If you throw that in, Italy in 150 years uh, has never had a public debt that is this high in relation to GP. There's absolutely no room for Italy to slip in terms of growth, uh, for Italy not to run into a uh, debt uh, crisis. Uh, the maturity of the debt, you know, I wouldn't say that a seven, eight year maturity of the debt when the debt is this big uh, is uh, that comforting because what it means is you've really got to roll over uh, something like 200, 300 billion dollars uh, of debt every, every year. year, which could be challenging, you know, if, as Sylvia mentioned, uh, the foreigners are already making the exit. The Italian government is forcing the banks uh, to buy the bonds. Another aspect where uh, Italy uh, really uh, is of concern is it really, like Alex mentioned, uh, I had written, it's got the shakiest of banking systems. Uh, not only are the non-performing loans really very high, you know, they have come down some, but they're still clearly in double digits in relation to uh, their uh, balance sheet. You know, you've got something like 12% of their balance sheet is non-performing loans. Uh, but on top of that, they stuffed with government paper. They're holding something like $400 billion. You're talking about 20% of GDP is in the Italian banks. So you've got very weak uh, economic growth and you've got a very high debt. All you've got to go is slip is slightly into recession uh, and you're going to have a, uh, an enormous funding problem. Another reason that uh, I'm pessimistic about Italy is that I think that this is a very different situation uh, from Greece. Uh, this is an economy that is far larger than Greece, got far more debt than Greece had. Uh, there's no way that the euro can survive if, Greece, uh, if Italy were for some reason to withdraw or if Italy were to default on its debt. But by the same token, Italy is going to be hugely expensive to bail out. You're talking about a public, you're talking about a public debt market, a sovereign debt market that is the third largest sovereign debt market in the world. That this is after the United States and Japan. We're talking about two and a half trillion dollars of debt. This is going to involve, this is very large, even for an economy like Germany to bail out. And as I've mentioned, uh, Angela Merkel is running into a lot of resistance about repeated bailouts. So if the Italian government doesn't get its act together, uh, I see uh, Italy running into a, uh, a real debt crisis uh, pretty, t pretty soon. And I would think that what we have is we have uh, Italy moving into a vicious kind of circle. Uh, you know, it's the George Soros kind of idea that market prices, when they blow out, what they do is they cre create new fundamentals, that a situation that looks okay when the spreads are only 100 basis points doesn't look okay when the spreads are 300, 400 basis points. As the country goes into a bigger recession, as its deficit widens out, that's another reason for the markets to keep pushing the spreads uh, and uh, when ready, is going to have to count on their getting bailed out by the ECB. I just make one, uh, two final points. Uh, the one is, in my view, Italy differs from uh, Greece in terms of being bailed out in another respect, in that one cannot have a government that is defiant of not playing by the rules of the game, expecting to be bailed out. So we could very well get a situation like we had uh, in Italy around about 2012, where the ECB made its bailout essentially conditional of getting a technocratic government in place. You know, that could create a lot of political problems for Italy. I don't pretend uh, to be an expert on how that would play out politically, but I would think it would be uh, uh, pretty, um, pretty messy. 
The last point I'd make is that uh, Italy uh, is hugely systemic. You know, if things go wrong in Italy, uh, this is a big deal for the global economy, not simply that it's got an enormous government bond market, uh, but just a question of what it would mean for the French and the German banks, what this would mean. This, to me, would look like it would be layman in reverse, you know, a crisis beginning uh, in some far-flung place comes back to uh, hit the United States. Alex, uh, those are my cheerful reflections. Thank you, uh, Desmond. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you just heard a great five-part seminar in the economics, politics, and finances uh, of Italy in the context of Europe and the context of the world. I want to give the panelists, I, I know you have something you want to say, Luigi, and you're going to be first because we're going to go right down the panel in the same order, about two minutes, absolute maximum three minutes each to uh, react to anything someone else said or, or add to your own thoughts. Luigi. So when I mentioned that uh, the situation is critical but not serious, I didn't mean that uh, this is playing with words, but it is uh, is not taken seriously. And I think that uh, part of the debate in Italy uh, is reflected here. This is uh, Ashok, uh, Desmond, and I emphasize the fundamental structural situation. And this situation is not going to be changed by a budget deficit of 2.1 or 2.2 or 2.4. So the extreme level of attention that this number, and this is if I could have a reassurance that the actual ex post budget this year is only 2.4%, I would sign here. Okay, because I think the situation is going to be much worse. Okay, ex post, ex ante. So I think that uh, what we need to ask ourselves is what do we do about the fact that Italy does not belong to the euro? I think that that's a, a, a fundamental problem that is not going to be solved with playing around with the budget. Okay, so we need to figure out or either we change dramatically Italy to make it fit the euro or we change the euro rules or we change, we exit the euro. I think that there's nothing else is possible. And here is where the politics comes in. I think that uh, Ashok mentioned in Vincol Esterno, I prefer to say the orthopedic view of the euro. Okay? So the Italian system, as always designed, has been thought, the intelligence in Italy say, basically, we don't want democracy in our country because we don't trust our voters to vote the right way. So we want to put a caste, and that's the euro, and we're going to impose on it. And as uh, Carlo was saying, it works. Yeah, it works in limiting. It works in creating resentment. So if you think this election are not a sign of how resentful the country is, what are you waiting for? Is, there, there was a beautiful article of Guido Tabellini, who was a great economist, that would made a parallel between Germany of the 1930s and Italy. The part that he forgot is the role play by the foreign powers in Germany in the 1930s. Because if in Germany in 1930 Hitler could arise, it was also because the foreign nations were absolutely in, inflexible in saying, you have to pay all your debt, no question asked. And that led to the disaster we know. I think that uh, Europe is playing this role. And uh, the more we force the cast the more we are in a situation, either we give up democracy, because I don't know how, how you're going to get the vote to put, like, uh, Cotarelli as a prime minister, uh, because that's the plan. Cotarelli's on TV every day, so the plan is to have Cotarelli as a prime minister. But so far, we need to have votes in parliament. And uh, uh, if you have votes in parliament, even with a spread, etc., either you buy them, Berlusconi used to buy them, uh, I don't know that there is anybody rich enough to buy them. Or what are you going to do? Uh, so I think we need to confront the fact that it's not just the north and south divide that you're talking about is, is, is there, of course. It's very important. But it's much bigger than that. Yeah. It's much bigger than that. And we need to confront it openly and not sort of blame the voters because they actually want to change. Because uh, And even if you think that this change is uh, inappropriate, uh, as long as you're in democracy, you cannot blame the voters. You need to sort of understand them and try to change. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'll, I, I, I'll be very brief. So uh, 
I call my book Euro Tragedy, and I say Italy is the theater in which Euro Tragedy is being played out. Uh, Italy has all the p dysfunctions of the Euro area in a magnified form. Political, the economic, the financial. It, 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 it is, it is the, in, in, in 1998, there was a clear understanding that Italy should not be in the original membership of the Eurozone. This was a well-accepted fact. And then Chancellor Helmut Kohl, for some reason, decided that Italy needed to be part of the Eurozone. Sort of a, a, a very strange pro-Europeanism. The strange pro-Europeanism says that more is better. And, and Kohl decided, despite enormous resistance from his own ministers, uh, uh, my former colleagues from the IMF will remember, Host Kohler was the chief negotiator at Maastricht. Kohler wrote an unsolicited letter to Kohl saying, Italy does not belong to the Eurozone. Stefan Engling, who was executive director at the Fund from Germany, was a, an attaché in Rome. He sent telegrams to the finance ministry saying, Italy does not belong to the Eurozone. The, 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 the problem is that the structure has been set up completely without thinking. And you know, the, the vincolo esterno may work in, in, in modulating the uh, deficit from 2.4 to 2.2 percent, but the vincula esterno does not work to generate productivity in the Italian system. And unless there's productivity in the Italian system, nothing else matters. Uh, I'll just say one last theme on picking up on Sylvia. The, the 2.4 percent is such a silly number to focus on. You know, it, nobody even knows whether it'll be 2.4%. Uh, nobody can estimate these things within, a, within a several decimal points. As, as somebody who spent several years at the IMF, I mean, these numbers are completely meaningless. You know, the, the deficit may be 2%, it may be 2.8%. That's sort of the margin of error within which these numbers are played around. I mean, for anybody to, to, to sort of assume otherwise that, and, and uh, Carlo showed those tables, those numbers are revised within six months of, each, uh, of them. So focusing on the 2.4 is silly. The, the problem over here is, I, I thought that uh, Luigi is going to talk about another uh, Roma Prodi quote, which is, the fiscal rules are stupid. And he, he repeated that twice. And the fiscal rules are completely economically illiterate. And, and politically dysfunctional. And the idea that Europe can dictate uh, is, is just is, is, is silly, but the narrative has grown that somehow there is, they are sacrosanct. And that narrative, more than the numbers, is what is creating some of the tensions right now. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, so following up on uh, the 2.4 number, um, I agree that the 2.4 number, uh, it per se, is maybe meaningless in terms of what it represents economically and going forward, but it's not meaningless in the political implication that it has. So the risks that the whole narrative around it creates both at the European level and the Italian level is, is going to be very relevant in the next, in the next month, I believe. Uh, that being said, I, I beg to disagree on... Um, on both of your your characterization of Italy membership in the Europe uh, in the Euro and um, and the success or failure of the external constraint, I, I do think the external constraint worked well in the run up to the Euro, uh, and then it it I ceased agree. to no, work. Yeah. yeah, and then it ceased sure. to work. So the question is why it ceased to work and what are the implications of that going forward? And I entirely agree with the shock that Italy is a miniature of the problem that we're having at the Eurozone level, where we have a north pitted against the south, they have completely different uh, macroeconomic preferences, both in terms of fiscal and monetary policy, uh, uh, perhaps. So the, the really big question for me is what Italy tells us about uh, Eurozone governance reform going forward. So if we were to draw on the Italian examples, we'd probably be hopeless for uh, Eurozone governance reform going forward 
because this, this north-south divide has been there for so long and it's never been bridged entirely. And uh, in 2018, we see, it, uh, we see how important this is in determining political outcomes and determining then uh, policy options on the, on the macroeconomic side. Uh, so I think this is really um, uh, a very interesting angle to look at Eurozone reform. Thank you. Uh, well, I agree with Sylvia that we have to be more sober and humble in uh, cultural characterization and cutting uh, countries and continents uh, out of uh, prejudices and stereotypes. Uh, Italy and Germany grew at the same path between 97 and 2007. After 2007, Italy's manufacturing sector lost one-fourth of its firms. The level of productivity of the remaining sector is higher than in Germany. In the last 10 years, the productivity of the manufacturing sector was 15.3 against 12.3 by the German uh, equivalent uh, category. Um, the, what, what, what could not happen was a transfer of uh, jobs from uh, the vanishing uh, sector to the selected more efficient firms. There are many things, almost everything doesn't work in Italy. I've lived in so many countries that I tend not to believe to the story that for some reason one country uh, is not uh, capable of uh, having the same mentality or the same culture, cultural quality. Uh, verification of this is given by the fact that you're dealing with two countries in one. Same rules, same government, same laws, same schools, same hospitals. Some are working, some are not. And nobody is blaming the electorate. Nobody at all. We are actually listening. I try to listen to the real voice, which is not only anger, it's a demand for solution. This is my point. Thank you. Desmond? Yeah, just let me make uh, two brief points. Is First, I think that uh, the budget deficit number of 2.4 does have considerable significance in that that is a very clear sign to the markets that this government isn't particularly serious about wanting to reduce the public debt. It's not particularly serious about wanting to comply with European rules. So even though I totally agree that uh, that number is going to be very different from the 2.4% in the outcome, what I think it does is it signals that this government is moving in the opposite direction, that the markets are wanting to see a government that's serious about bringing down the debt. This government on two scores is one, it seems to be fairly uh, uh, nonchalant about letting the budget expenditure and tax receipts decline, let the deficit go out that way. It's doing nothing to promote economic growth. So I think that by indicating that you are prepared to allow the budget deficit to expand, and probably it expands a lot more than you think it's going to do because the economy is going to sink, you're just telling the markets, we're not serious about repaying this debt. And in an environment where you've got different liquidity conditions, where people now can go to the United States get in treasuries a very safe return on an appreciating uh, currency, uh, why do you want to take risks in Italy? And you know, that's why I think you had in a single month, two months, you had something like $40 billion each month being taken out by foreigners out of Italy, and that's a very uh, dangerous sign. Just the second point, uh, very briefly, is one point on which I disagree about Ashoka, uh, is that the uh, last thing that I'd worry about uh, is uh, the euro appreciating in this context. You know, that I think that what's occurring is we're now going to get a greater divergence between United States monetary policy and European monetary policy. United States running a big budget deficit, expansive fiscal policy, 
they're going to have to tighten the interest rates at a faster rate than they thought. If Italy is coming apart, uh, the European uh, Central Bank is going to have second thoughts about exiting uh, uh, quantitative easing at the end of this year. They're also going to have second thoughts about raising interest rates anytime soon. So I think that that divergence is very likely to keep the uh, uh, dollar strong, the euro weak, uh, but that doesn't mean that Italy is going to get bailed out by a weak euro. The bigger things going on. Thank you. Anybody else? One more short comment? Just on the euro, yes. what I, I will say is that uh, by, by the logic, Desmond, that you offer, the euro should have become much weaker already. In other words, the uh, Federal Reserve has been withdrawing QE for, since, for about three years, and the euro has remained relatively stable. The euro remains stable, not because the ECB, uh, because the, the, uh, what's happening in America, the euro remains stable because there is a perception in the markets that the ECB maintains a tight bias. And so the euro is now going to remain where it is, in my view, at about 1.15, 1.6, unless Italy has a crisis. If Italy has a crisis, the euro will go down. But until Italy has a crisis, the euro will not go down. How many members of the panel think Italy will have a crisis? Well, like when? Within a, a year, let's say. <laughs> yeah, I, I would think certainly when? within a year. Depends what you mean a crisis. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think that uh, likely, yeah. But uh, uh, just factually, uh, Ashok, What's occurred is that the dollar at the start of the year was trading at something like 130. It's now trading at 115. You know, so the dollar has had something like an 8% appreciation uh, since the start of the year. You know, and I think that the dollar's only getting going. All right. Great discussion, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to turn to your questions. Uh, I will remind you, please, when. Uh, um, when you are called on, please wait for the microphone to come. When you get it, uh, tell us your name and affiliation, and then ask your question. Sometimes it occurs in these sessions uh, that people decide to give a lecture before they get to their question. <laughs> if that uh, inspiration should happen to you, the chair will remind you that it's time to come to your question. Uh, Paul, we'll start here, and then I'll come to you, sir, right here, and then I'll come to you. Thanks. I, I'm Paul London. I, I have no particular uh, association at this time, but I was in the State Department 40 or 50 years ago when the common market was being formed, when, when Britain was going in. It always seemed to me, uh, and I think this is what Professor Zingales was saying, that, that in many ways the, the whole European thing was too ambitious. I mean, common market is uh, gets you uh, to a certain place, but you have these countries are different, and Italy is not the only one that's different. They they all have these different <laughs> characteristics, and I wonder if, if we're not talking about too narrow a thing here. Talking about Italy, we're we're talking about really what's going on, the sort of unwinding of this enormously ambitious effort that in some ways, to me, always seemed like it was going against nature. Okay, so the question is, was the, if I can paraphrase, Paul, was the, uh, was the European Union and particularly the Euro too ambitious? And in addition to Italy, are there others maybe we should be talking about? I Luigi. think there's a question of what time horizon. I think as an ideal is a fantastic idea, but as, as De Gaulle used to say for France, it's difficult to run a country with so many types of cheese. And I think that applies to Europe as well. In the United States, it's easier because you just have cheddar cheese all over the place. So uh, it's a much more, but I think in, in the way of the goal, this is a, a proxy of culture. I think that uh, the United States are much more integrated, and uh, as a result, it's easier to run them as a, a unified nation. Uh, in Europe not. And so I think that the biggest achievement of Europe was the creation of this Erasmus program where students spend a semester in a different country. 
And that's really the step to a creation of the European spirit. And, uh, and I think that's a beautiful idea we should aspire to, but it's so difficult to achieve that you don't want to accelerate. And I think the, U the euro has been a false acceleration for political reasons that my, as Milton Friedman used to say, actually turned out to backfire. Uh, Milton Friedman said uh, there is this idea that the euro will uh, prevent any war in Europe, any tension in Europe, and I think that is going to be the other way around. And uh, as usual, Milton Friedman was right. Other comments, Sylvia? Yeah, so the only thing I would say is that I'd make a difference between the inside. common market and the euro. The common market was a great idea. So basically, what the, the way I, I read the Single history market, is that up until the late 60s, Europe did a magnificent job in dealing with its post-war ills. But then it took the wrong turn with the euro. Whereas the, a common market enhances the value of diversity. The euro is inimical to diversity. The euro requires much greater congruence in, 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 in both economic structures and economic trajectories. And because, therefore, it, therefore, for nearly 30 years, it did not happen. Because everybody understood, not just Milton Friedman in 1990, but in 1970, Nikki Calder said exactly that. So everybody understood that this, this is an animal that is going to create not only economic uh, divergence, but create political divisions. And yet they went through with this. So therefore, it is not, it is not Europe that's the problem. It is the euro superimposed on a structure that actually was working quite well. Sylvia, you had a comment? Yeah, uh, I think Can we give Sylvia the, her microphone, oh, yeah. Carlo? <laughs> <laughs> My own um, I think if we look back uh, historically at the process of European integration, there is one thing that is remarkably constant, and it's the fact that there are a lot of setbacks. There have been a lot of setbacks over the years from the European defense community in the 50s, European policy community, um, the empty chair crisis, the monetary crisis in the early 90s, and it's always been going forward. Uh, it's always been producing further integration. And I think the euro itself is not an exception from an institutional standpoint because the crisis showed that really um, the institutional setup of the euro of the euro had significant flaws that that made him particularly weak in uh, context of financial crisis. And some of those flaws from the institutional standpoint have been addressed with banking union, for example. I do think banking union is not complete, but in the aim, it is one of the major step forward in European integration that we have seen recently. What remains to be seen is whether this can uh, withstand political polarization. Um, one of the things that is missing in the, in the euro context is a, a, a genuine underlying political union which back in the days when this was the project was started, people thought would be too ambitious to go for uh, before having achieved uh, economic integration and monetary integration. And we have seen the cost of this uh, during the crisis and today. So the real question is whether we can overcome this moment of very deep political polarization that we're living in right now uh, to then move forward on that, on that particular aspect too. Thanks, Paul. Great, great question. Could you hand your microphone to the gentleman next to you, and we'll proceed. Thank you. I'm Victor Stone. I don't have a particular affiliation either. I was wondering, because having heard the, the panel, uh, I'm sure they've all thought about what happens next, and I was wondering if the panel members have some thoughts on life preservers that could be thrown to Italy, and the two that pop into my mind, and they may be totally unrealistic, are items like allowing immigration by people with high-tech degrees from the rest of the world who are looking to get to a European country, or removing all vehicle registration taxes on vehicles made in Italy, ways that would stimulate that economy and give it some juice. Okay, panel, how about life preservers for Italy? So, so I mean, the, the real question is, I mean, you're talking about some very long-term stuff. Uh, if Italy has a crisis in the next, whatever, 18 months, the question is, can the European Eurozone save Italy? So this is the too big to save phenomenon. So the way it will work is that Italy will ne need to negotiate a program with something called the European Stability Mechanism. 
it's not clear to me that any Italian government can negotiate in any timely manner a program with the ESM, especially in view of what Carlo was saying about the fact that there's already pressure from the northern governments to rethink the concept of ESM itself. Moreover, Italy is so large that there is every likelihood that if the ESM was to offer a loan to Italy, the ESM itself could be downgraded because the ESM's resources would be so severely tested at that point. Even, even under the Greek program, there was some risk that the, uh, that the German credit rating would be downgraded. Once that happens, then there will be the prospect of uh, something called OMTs, the outright monetary transactions from the European Central Bank. So while this negotiation with the ESM is going, going on, and it is fractious, if you think that the 2.4 is fractious, you can just imagine what the nature of the discussion and the elevated uh, sense of anxiety in the world will be if the Italy is negotiating an ESM program. Yields are going up. Bank stocks are going down. Italy is becoming even more of a liability. And at that point, if the ECB is asked to buy Italian bonds, there's the governing council, which will ask the question, oops, if we buy and Italy defaults, who is going to hold the burden? So therefore, while it is true in principle that there is a financial structure, this financial structure is subject to severe political limits. And the question is, when those political limits are tested, how will the Europeans react? Carlo, excuse me. Hang, hang on, excuse me. Carlo. Let, me, let me just add something to what Ashcott said. I mean, uh, this huge challenge of saving Italy from its own crisis. Italy has a positive balance of payments, has a net saving asset position which is positive, has more savings than debts. Hidden debts like pension or other things are uh, much more under control than in, I guess, all other large European countries. Uh, so eventually it's a matter of building an institutional constraint, but not of pouring money in the same size relative to GDP as for other countries. Doesn't second point oh, is... sorry, Carl. Go ahead. Sorry. Second point is uh, the euro and populism. I see populism all around Euro the euro area. I see populism in the UK and I see uh, it's in Sweden, I see it uh, wherever in the strong euro area countries. I see autocrats growing stronger in Eastern Europe, in Turkey, in wherever. I don't see it as the euro area as a, as a hallmark, as populism as a hallmark of the euro. And this is exactly the point, the euro is not the problem. It's not Europe is good and the euro is bad. Europe before the euro was under constant crisis and, uh, and exchange rate instability. It didn't work. And it actually at least made some cultural convergence prevail in most countries. 2.4 is a stupid figure, but we all debate about fiscal sustainability talking about 2.4. In the 80s, nobody in Italy was talking about fiscal sustainability. This is cultural change, cultural homogeneity. Desmond. Yeah, I uh, very much agree with Ashok that if the ECB or the ESM were to come and support Italy, it would have to be based on Italy complying with conditions, introducing budget discipline, maybe structural reform. But the basic problem is you've got a government that has been put there by the electorate to actually resist that kind of pressure. So we've got a really very basic problem in how you're going to get an agreement with this government that goes against its mandate. You know, so I don't see a life preserver being very easy to do. Uh, just in terms of the balance of payments, you know, this is rather... Uh, an important issue is that one really doesn't look simply at the current account, 
one really looks at the capital accounts. So if Italians begin moving money out of the Italian banking system into Europe, that is going to be very problematic for Germany in that we've already got a situation where target two balances of Germany are a positive 950 billion euros. Uh, Germany, Germans are already fretting about the size of this. Italy's got the potential to move that several hundred billion euros higher if the Italians begin pushing the money out. Uh, and that is going to be another reason. Germany is going to, at some point, uh, think as to whether uh, they should not cut their losses. This is just throwing money down the hole. You've really got to be looking at this in terms of Germany. There's a lot of uh, bailout fatigue already there. So hopefully Italy doesn't get into a crisis because I'm not sure uh, that the lifesavers are going to come that easily. Thanks. Good sorry, question. I'm sorry, I, I need to intervene here. You, you, because, you, have, no, you no, can no. intervene, then we're coming to you, sir, and I have other the questions, bailout fatigue we'll come of back Germany. to you. Let, let's set the record straight. Germany has not bailed out any country in Europe. In fact, it's the other way around. The other country in Europe bail out the, <laughs> the German banks that had lent to Greece, had lent to Ireland, and lent to everybody. The only real bailout that Germany did is for their own banks that were bankrupt, and they don't want to discuss it. The target, too, is not a liability of Italy, first of all, because there are assets versus liabilities. So it's a liability of the Bank of Italy that has assets on the other side, the Italian debt. Now, if as long as the euro exists, that's just like a liability entry of the Federal Reserve of Chicago versus the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis. Uh, I don't think that that's... It's not it, This attitude is what exactly generates the tension. <laughs> what Friedman said, once you have a common <laughs> currency, you start to pitch the lazy Greeks against the Nazi Germany. We didn't used to say that. And we do say that in spite of the fact that, at least until recently, there were more Nazis in, in Greece uh, with a, a, a golden dawn and more lazy in Germany because actually Greek people work harder than the Germans if you look at the statistics. Right. So can I just follow up on this very quickly? You will give it one quick quickly. thing, and then uh, I, I want to get in at least two more because questions. So, yes. I, for once, entirely agree with you. Uh, and I wanted to <laughs> mark this moment, this moment of enlightenment. Um, I do agree with him that tar as far as the euro stays together, Target 2 is essentially a plumbing system. Um, and it's nothing more than that. Then if we move to the scenario where the euro breaks up, then yes, of course, those becomes actual liabilities and assets, but that would probably be the least of our problems, I would say. Uh, and, and then following up on that, um, as far as the um, position of Italy is concerned, I think that one of the things that is very often overlooked in the debate is that Italy has been in this very um, peculiar position of being a country with a very high debt, but being a creditor in terms of uh, its position in the Eurozone system vis-a-vis -vis the countries that have been bailed out. Um, and at the same time, I think this is um, a fed back into the political narrative domestically, uh, in, in, in that it has sort of created this perception that beside it, uh, um, regardless of being a creditor in terms of um, their position within the Eurozone, they have been effectively treated as a debtor. So I think this is, um, uh, it's been a very important point in the political developments as well. This is a really interesting discussion, and those of you who want to pursue it come up afterwards. <laughs> right now this gentleman's been waiting. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. My name is Massimo Russo. I'm uh, both from ex-IMF and ex-European uh, Commission. I'm chief economist there several years ago, and I had to deal then with Greece in 1985. <laughs> I, I believe, uh, with all of you, I think, that uh, the probability of a major crisis, or let's put this way, of Italy leaving the euro or e Italy being thrown out of the euro is high now. The question is that what the federalists that pushed for the uh, euro zone, the creation of a common currency, uh, they knew that they had done something imperfect. But they also thought that uh, the cost of leaving the union once you are in would be so high that nobody would dare to do that. 
the cost for the country and the cost for the union itself. Now, I would like to understand from the panel if this terrible event happens, what will be the cost in Italy, politically and economically? Somebody has mentioned a possible constitutional crisis in Italy between uh, the president or the pro-Europeans and the others. Certainly the economic crisis will be major and Greece went close to that point. They even prepared the substitute currency but then at the last minute they withdrew and they got scared. So what would be the scenario in Italy if we get to that point? Great question. Who on the panel wants to take that up? So uh, uh, let me give you my answer. Uh, I think that if Italy was to exit the euro, it would be a catastrophic event. It would be catastrophic not only for Italy, it would be catastrophic for the world. It would be catastrophic for the world because Italian debts now are denominated in the euro, but the lira, I would expect that a lira, once there is a, a, an exit, could be anywhere between three and five lira to a euro. Because once the exchange rate begins to depreciate, it dip can depreciate to any level. Even if it is two, the level of debts will double. Italians will not be able to repay their debts. The, the creditors of those Italians will not be able to repay their debts. They'll be cascading defaults through the financial system. And there will be, as, as Desmond said, a Lehman-like crisis because the size of the debts involved in the banking system are so extensive that the spillovers at that point will be just far too ex extensive. Therefore, an Italian exit is not something that we, can, we should even contemplate because it is an extraordinarily bad event. Therefore, if Italy does come to the point where it is, that possibility becomes real, there is only one non-painful way of, of breaking up the euro. And that is for Germany to exit. Because Germany is the only country that can exit with some pain to Germany, but a pain that Germany can bear, which will not have repercussions for the rest of the world. And so a German exit will cause the euro to depreciate. The Deutsche Mark will appreciate. That depreciation will help the countries of the South very likely the Netherlands and Austria would leave the next day and join with Germany. There would be an, a natural north-south divide that will occur and it will be something of an equilibrium for a short time till the Italians mess up their economy again. And then <laughs> there will perhaps be another breakup of that smaller system. But at the, in the first instance, the, pos the, the great success of the euro, the only real success of the euro is how hard it is to break it up. And so, an Italian exit <laughs> is not what we should be even contemplating. Thank you. I mean, we're almost out of time, but I'm going to take one more question. You've been waiting here. Let me say, again, for those of you whose questions we didn't get to, please feel free afterwards to come up and talk with the panel informally, because these are all really interesting questions. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello. My name is Francesca Galli, and I'm an intern at the Cato Institute here in DC. Uh, thank you for the discussion. My question has to do with um, the potentials that Italy has um, as a country. I'm sure uh, you've been Italians abroad, you know, everybody knows about Italy, everybody knows about how beautiful the country is and uh, well, you could, there's a huge list of things that are amazing about Italy and Italy is also an industrial power, it's probably only second to Germany in Europe or probably even not second to Germany. So what are the levers that we can pull in this um, in, in Italy to achieve growth? Because the, the problem here is productivity and economic growth. And there are, there's a huge cultural potential like this World Heritage sites, um, the food. I mean, you could go on and on. So what is that we could uh, exploit there and also link to this, what do you think the European I think I'm, I'm going to stop you there because that's a good question okay. that far and that's our last one. What, what are the strengths that Italy could and should uh, build on faced with these problems? Anyone? Yeah. 
It would seem to me that that's a rather theoretical question, you know, what Italy could do. You know, it would be very easy to uh, list a whole lot of reforms that could get the country going. The real question is how likely is that to happen? And it seems to me that the tragedy of Italy is that its economic performance within the euro having to do budget austerity within the straitjacket of a euro has led to many years of very poor economic performance, very high levels of unemployment that has given, that has resulted in the elite or the center being totally discredited. So now what you've got is you've got the extremes that aren't even thinking in terms of how you can reform that economy. They're rather thinking how you're going to be unwinding uh, some of the reforms. So I think that you know, your question, you could just go to the IMF or the World Bank and then give you a laundry list of things that the country should do. Uh, but the chances of it doing, because of this history, uh, because of having a very bad experience with austerity and with reforms under previous Italian governments, I would think that the chances of that occurring are remote. Thank you, Desmond. With that, we are out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, let's show our appreciation for a great panel. And thank you all very much for coming.